I am now recording. And I want to talk about this first because I think if I talk about this first, it will help with problems number three and four on the second assignment. Because like I said, problems three and four, this, this is the part that makes everybody crazy. This is the part that I think is the pain in the you know what. I almost said it, <laughs> but I'm being recorded. But this is the problem, right? This is the annoying issue. So um, it's like I said, like the old school way of finding a p-value. But again, like I said before I started recording, after these types of problems, if I want a p-value, I'm not going through this process. I'm going to use a calculator trick. But I'm still going to use the calculator trick on this one to not only get my test statistic, because I'm not going to go through the formula, but also to verify the p-value um, that I get. I want to show you this first because I'm going to make some values up to show you how these p-values are found based on the test statistic, okay? And obviously the location of the test statistic can depend on the type of test that you have, right? Uh, where are those tests that I talked about? Right, left tail test, area in the left tail, rejection region in the left tail, typically test statistics should be in the left. Right tail test, re uh, rejection region in the right, critical value positive, also test statistics should probably be there unless it's a crazy test. Two tail test, then we have two rejection regions, two critical values, but you only always have one test statistic. So when you have a two tail test, this is the situation and, and that's what problem four is gonna do. Where is it? Where? Problem four is gonna do is gonna show you how to find an area in one tail that we have to double to find total area to represent p-value. So I'm gonna make up numbers here. Let's say I have a left tail test, making up numbers. And for like a left tail test, I'll come back to problem four in a second. I get a test statistic, I'll make it a z-score just cause that's where we're at right now for now. Actually, I'll mix it up with z and t, okay? But let's say I have a t-score for my test statistic that is, I don't know, negative 2.3, okay? and I want to find the p-value. And so the test statistic, <laughs> the test statistic is the value that is separating that p-value from the rest of the area. And so we find the p-value, it is an area based on where the test statistic is located. So here is my test statistic, negative 2.3. It's a z-score, which means I'm on a standard normal distribution curve. And if I want to find area, under a standard normal distribution curve, if you guys remember, I'm gonna go normal CDF. If you recall, back in the good old days, normal CDF is found second bars. Anytime you wanna find a critical value, you should be used to that second bars, inverse norm. But now we're finding a p-value after this problem, you're not gonna do it this way again, but we're finding a p-value and we need an area Anytime we need an area on a uh, standard normal distribution curve, we go normal CDF. If you remember, you have to bound the area, right? Lower, upper. So we have to tell it, you know, between what two values this area is located. And you can see the p-values, this area in the left tail with a left lower, bow, uh, lower value or lower bound of negative infinity. So we used, back in the day, <laughs> what, a few weeks ago, negative one second, comma to pull up that e 99 to represent a very large negative number or you could just put negative one with a bunch of zeros there if you want my upper bound being that it's left tailed right is um this test statistic negative 2.3 right <clears throat> now being that i'm on a standard normal distribution curve my mean is zero my standard deviation is one anytime i talk about z scores right i repeated that a few times for a reason now you guys know why I get 0 0.0107. So for this particular, particular, um, I'm gonna write it over here, particular left tail test, let's assume the test statistic is negative 2.3, my p-value is 0 0.0107. So this is how we find a p-value, I'm gonna call it the old school method, the old school way, right? If that's a left tail test, it's the area to the left. Now, if you remember your notation, back in the good old days, when you were talking about an area on a standard normal distribution curve, it is also known as a probability that I randomly select a value or a z-score, and it is less than in this particular situation than this test statistic, which is negative 2.3. 
Now, um, you'll see they're using less than or equal to, but but this is the notation that was used. I don't remember what week it was, but but that's kind of why they're using it in this problem too, right? Probability because it's an area. If it's a right-tailed test, let me make up a test statistic. Let's call the test statistic 1.1. If it's in the right tail, positive test statistic, then the p-value again is an area, but this time to the right. So this is an, like saying the probability, <clears throat> excuse me, that I randomly choose a z-score and it's bigger than 1.1. <clears throat> and um, to find an area, right? If I know a z-score, I go normal CDF. So this is refresher, right, from whatever week that was. Normal CDF, but in this particular case, second bars, right? Normal CDF for the area. My lower bound is 1.1, right? I'm bounding my area, but this time it's the right tail, so the lower portion of this is 1.1. The, the higher portion of this is positive infinity. You can use one second comma to pull up this E, which is scientific notation, 99 to represent a very large positive number. Because it's a z-score, you leave your mu and your sigma as 0 and 1. And this time I get 0.1357. So the p-value here would be 0 0.1357. 0 point, no, 0 0.1357, not 0, 0.0. Okay? Now these are for one-tailed tests. If I have two-tailed tests, I can only find one area at a time if I'm using normal CDF. So you could find either area. You could potentially say, depending on the test statistic, right? Um, it's a symmetric curve, but let's say that the test statistic, I put it over here. So let's say we get a test statistic that is E is negative 0 0.23, right? And so that's over here. But, but this area to the left of this test statistic is only representing one of the areas that represents the p-value. P-value in total is going to be the sum of both areas because it's a two-tailed test. So if I'm using, for this one, normal CDF to find the area, this is not going to equal the p-value because it's only going to find one of the areas at a time. But being that it's a symmetric curve, the areas are the same. I don't necessarily need to find two areas. Once I find one, I find the other. And therefore, I could get the p-value by doubling one of the areas. So if I'm doing area in the left tail, see, um, and that's based on the test statistic and where it's located, because it could be either one. Again, second bars, normal CDF. Uh, I'm just going to put a large like this negative number just to show you if you really want to do it that way. It's up to you. Upper is negative 0.23. And then I'm on a standard normal distribution curve because of z-score, right? So read my mu, 0, my standard deviation, 1. 0 0.4090 is this area. Oops. This is approximately 0 0.4090. But that's not my p-value because it's a two-tailed test. Normal CDF only gives me one of the areas. But if I double it, uh, 4090. <laughs> if I double it, because it's a symmetric curve, the two areas are the same, now I get my p-value, 0.8181, which is a huge p-value. Uh, 0 0.8181. So I wanted to show it like this. I'm going to probably erase this just for your notes, but um, to keep them nice and neat. But that's how you find a p-value <laughs> if you don't have your graphing calculator trick and you're using like old methods. You you have a formula to calculate the test statistic. Then once you know the test statistic, the p-value is the area, you know, in either extreme region of the test statistic. So the test statistic is telling us the location of the p-value. And remember, p-value is an area and therefore it's a probability, which is why we're using this notation. So, you know, the location of it is dependent on the type of test and dependent on where the test statistic is. So, knowing that, I'm going to come back to this problem, which we already input our values, right, for. Um, let's read it and see what we get. The average McDonald's 
I'm going to use blue. So hopefully this helps. The average McDonald's restaurant generates this many millions. <clears throat> These are probably only millions, so I don't have to write a bunch of zeros. The average McDonald's restaurant generates. So this sounds like, you know, like for the population, the average is whatever. So let's use this color. I'm going to write it over here. So the population for the, you know, average McDonald's restaurant is 3.4 million. Okay, so this is in millions with a standard deviation of 0 0.5. And being that we're talking about the average McDonald's restaurant, like all in general, as in population, this is a population standard deviation. Okay, and that, you know, sometimes they directly give that to you. The population standard deviation is sigma is, and sometimes they talk about it in words, and you have to very you have to pull out that it is sigma rather than s. So again, the average McDonald's restaurant in general, that's a population, generates this many million dollars in sales. That's a population average, with a standard deviation of 0 0.5. That's a population standard deviation. Well, Michelle wants to know if the average sal uh, sa sales generated by McDonald's restaurants in Florida is different than the worldwide average. So she wants to run a test to see if this particular population, which is in Florida, ironically, is different than this worldwide average of 3.4. So let's go here. Um, I'm probably going to write it over here too, just to make it a little neater, but you got a lot of drop down stuff and this is annoying, right? But I get it. At the end of the day, actually, I'll come back to it in a second. Remember when I said that we have a claim, we automatically write our null and our alternative hypothesis. And we want to determine if the claim is regarding a mean or a proportion. And in this particular case, we're talking about average. So we want to put mu. Now, what does mu represent in this case? Mu represents the average sales generated by McDonald's restaurants in Florida. This is the population of McDonald's restaurants in Florida. This is the population mean for, you know, all McDonald's restaurants. But we're comparing this to that. I want to know if it differs. Remember that anything regarding a not equal to symbol goes on the alternative. So it's either different or it is equal to. 3.4. Okay. Now it'd be different if she said like she wants to test to see if um, the average sales generated by McDonald's restaurant in Florida is greater than the worldwide average, then I would change the alternative to greater than. Okay. And that would make it a right tail test. If she said it was less than, she wanted to um, test the claim that it's less than the worldwide average, and this would be a less than symbol. It would be a left tail test. So obviously there are a lot of different types of hypothesis tests that you can come up with to kind of play with the same idea. That's why sometimes it's like you could potentially do a lot of different tests for one particular thought, one particular topic like this. So, I mean, I naturally do this every time I do a hypothesis test, which is why I guess they're putting you through this. So your drop down menu here, this is why I have this up to, to remember what it is. But your drop down menu here, your options are either P or mu. And I mean, yeah, you're not doing P yet, that's next week, but how do you determine which one it is? You're running a test about an average. So this is mu, okay? Um, this is another drop down, which probably has all the symbols yet. Yeah. So each, each of these drop downs has every single inequality symbol or equal to symbol. You have to pick which one it is. And, and if I'm talking about the alternative hypothesis, I'm never putting anything that has an equal to on it. But at the end of the day, we wrote it here. So this is the not equal to, and this is um, equal to. What value? Well, we're running a test comparing it to 3.4. So this is kind of how we figure out what to put in all these different things. Oh, now I forgot to erase this, but it says, so we will be performing a, and then it has a drop down left, right, or two tailed test. I determine the type of test based on the alternative hypothesis. And again, even if I'm not guided like this, I would automatically say, well, the, no, the alternative hypothesis has a not equal to symbol, and this is a two tailed test. If we go back to my notes here, there are three types of tests that I can have and I determine which one based on the alternative hypothesis. And if it has a not equal to symbol, then I have a two-tailed test, which means I have two rejection regions, 
which means I have two critical values, which means alpha is split into two pieces, which means that, where's my other thing here? So much crap, which means, right, that I have um, one test statistic, but I have an area representing total p-value, right, if it's a two-tailed test. All these things are going off in my head. So two-tailed test, that, that's there. Assuming the null hypothesis is true, determine the features of the distribution of the point estimates using the central limit theorem. Anytime I hear the central limit theorem, I automatically go into the things that I learned before, where it's like, is it the basic situation? Is it the, the um, distribution of averages? Or is it the distribution of sums? So obviously I didn't erase this, but this is a drop down menu to determine which distribution you have. So by the central limit theorem, we know that the point estimates are, and it says either normally distributed or T distributed. And being that sigma is known, we're on a standard normal distribution curve, it's normally distributed, which the answer is there. I kind of wanted to erase this so it doesn't look all crazy. With distribution mean and distribution standard deviation of blank and blank. So remember that when we, thought about the central limit theorem, we remember that if we're selecting one, that we went to like the basic mu and sigma as the, the mean and the standard deviation of that distribution. But if we were selecting more than one or if we had a sample size, we went into, well, is it for the averages or is it for the sums? And this one is for the averages. So if you remember, oops, uh remember this new oh my goodness <laughs> that does not look like new new and then sigma over the square root of n remember this so because we are selecting 29 then we have and we're talking about averages then we're on this distribution here now this is just i feel like it's what is it reminding you of the central limit theorem talking about what you know distribution you're on your calculator tricks take care of all that um, anyway, so I don't always go through, I never go through this if I don't have to. <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, wait, let me see. I see a chat. Is that from you guys? Okay, not from this chat. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, so by the central limit theorem, we know that the point estimates are normally distributed. So this is the answer to that. With distribution mean blank. So we're gonna follow this now. So let's calculate this stuff. Um, <clears throat> if I'm doing this, the mean is mu, 3.4, and the standard deviation is going to vary because we're on the distribution of the averages. So sigma is 0 0.5 divided by the square root of n, where was n? 29, square root of 29. So that's what I'm gonna input here. So distribution mean of 3.4 and distribution standard deviation of blank, let me calculate this, 0.5 divided by second x squared to get the square root of 29. Point, now it looks like they're taking a bunch of decimals. they're not telling you how to round and it looks like they're taking a bunch of decimals you could put all that in there technically let me write a bunch of these 0 0.09 i'm not going to write all of them but 0 0.09 and 2877 i'm probably going to take a bunch of them because technically if i were doing this by hand then i would be um, taking at least five to six digits of that to calculate other things. But again, oops, the calculator trick does all that for me. So this is just making you go through things that later on you won't have to go through. That's why I'm like, get through them, okay? Now here's the part that you love the most. Find the p-value, right? But notice that you have all this, blah, 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 and then you have p-value equals. And the reason is because they're making you go through this normal CDF, find this area based on the test statistic, and then you'd have to double that to find the p-value because it's a two-tailed test. If it were a one-tailed test, 
then whatever you get from your normal CDF would match your p-value. So let me show you that here. So find the p-value of the point estimate. So the first drop down is either p tick, which is p hat, or x bar. So like sample proportion or um, sample mean. And your point estimate is always, you know, kind of like if you're doing a test about a population mean, then your point estimate is going to be a sample mean. If your um, hypothesis test is based on a population proportion, then your, your point estimate will be a, a sample proportion. And that just makes sense, right? Because it should match. I always do this and I just don't know why. I must be touching something that I just don't know. Um, so hold on, let me get that back on track. You see, I exited out a bunch of stuff. OK, I think I still. So <clears throat> which one would it be here? This one is going to be x bar. Now, <laughs> this is the part that's annoying, right? Um, I want to find my test statistic to help me determine like my area. Let's see what my test statistic is. And you know, technically, if it's a two-tailed test, you could potentially find either area, which you know technically could go greater than or less than. But let's see what we get for our test statistic to help us. Now, I'm not using calcul um, the formula to find my test statistic, so I'm using my calculator trick. And being that I'm using my calculator trick to find the test statistic, it's going to also give me the p-value. Calculator trick. I'm testing a claim about a mean and sigma, the population standard deviation, is known. I want to find a test statistic, which will give me my p-value, so I use z-test, okay? You guys will have all these notes. So let's go where's my, back to my um, calculator. We input the values already. Stat, because if I didn't, I'd have to input them. Stat, and then test. If you guys are watching this as a recording, then pause it, put the values in here and then pull back up so you could do it with us, right? So z-test and then data because I have a list of data values so this is highlighted. If it's not, go over it and press enter so it's highlighted. Here we go, mu not. So I'm gonna need to look at my null and my alternative hypothesis for that. And that is going to base, be based on the claimed value which 3.4, I have it in here already. 3.4. My population standard deviation they gave me to be 0 0.5. And you know, notice that if I use z-test, they always ask me for sigma. So it's a dead giveaway. <laughs> My list was in L1. If you put it somewhere else, then press second, and then whatever number corresponds to that list. So for me, second one for L1. Leave your frequency as one. You don't have to change that. If mine already has a two-tailed test. If yours doesn't, then scroll over to the not equal to and highlight it. Press enter. You don't need to worry about color or calculate. You could play with this to draw it, see what it looks like. You might see the curve, but you don't have to do that. And then this is my output. So let me copy and paste. Um, again and again and again, every single time, and I want you guys to make sure you get the same thing, but again and again and again, every single time that you guys do anything that ends in test, the output is always going to have the alternative hypothesis first, the test statistics second, and the p-value third. And then whatever information you have after that, which we might need, x bar is my sample mean. That means that I can determine the average of the sample. It gives me all that. I don't have to add all these up and divide by 29. Or I don't even have to go to one of our stats, if you remember how we used to do it back in the day, to find a sample mean and a sample standard deviation. It gives me that here too. It just gives me everything. X bar is 3.410345. We'll take a bunch of those. And my sample standard deviation, which is the standard deviation of the sample. Whoa, what just happened? What? Oh, thanks, you just crashed is equal to, you guys write that down while I figure this stupid thing out, is equal to, what, 0 0.41087, write all that down. Please come back to me. Recover, yes. I'm going to have to save this now before this trips on me again. Ah, okay. 
<laughs> that's always scary. Save as, what is this, week 12? No, let me save that now, because I didn't have it saved. Okay, back at it, right? My standard deviation for the sample is uh, 0 0.410874, okay? If I need it, which I may, may not, we'll see. So <clears throat> you guys got those values, right? Check in the chat. Okay, now let's see what I do with it. My test statistic is a positive. I'm gonna write that here. My test statistic is Z is approximately equal to 0 0.11142. Now I'm gonna write my p-value down as well because I'll verify it when I do all this crap to make sure I'm doing all this crap correctly. Excuse my language, but. <laughs> okay. It's not crap, it's money. <laughs> um, all right, now that I have my test statistic and I have my p-value, now I'm going to finish this part. <clears throat> and I want you guys to make sure you have the same test statistic and p-value as me, or if you're using your own values, you can verify it when you actually plug in your numbers. But if you need to, check your stuff, okay? Um, so now I have... Did I hear someone? No. So now I have to check to determine what are the drop downs here. The drop down here is like greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. Now, being that my test statistic is in the right tail, right? And technically it's a two tail test. I guess I'll draw this, which means I have two tails, but the test statistic is over here as a positive Z score. I'll just take a bunch of those. So I might find this area here and then double it to find my p-value. And to find this area, and that doesn't look like area, but that's what I wrote. I'm going to go normal seed, yeah. Right? Now, this, look at this long, like, I already have my p-value, but I'm still going through a process to find it. Now, being that it's the test statistic is in the right tail and I'm finding the area to the right, I'm going to use the greater than or equal to symbol here. Now, x bar is greater than or equal to, well, what's the sample mean? Well, the sample mean is this, 3 point, I'm going to take a bunch of those, 3.410345, right? This is not part of your problem. This is just the answer. And this is the same as if I standardize it as the probability that, and then your drop-down menu here is either a z or a t, well, we already determined, determined z, and your symbol here should match your symbol there, because if you're finding area in the right tail here and you're standardizing that curve, you should also find the area in the right tail here. And what is the Z score? Remember that the P value corresponds to um, the area of the test statistic. So my test statistic is 0 0.11142. Now again, this notation is saying probability that blah. So this last thing that I input is that area because the probability is area but i'm only finding the area in the right tail because normal cdf can only do one area at a time um normal cdf let's look at my curve while i do it is found second bars normal cdf because i'm looking for area enter Bound my area, I'm going to bound it with my lower bound, which is this z-score, which is the test statistic, 0.11142. Upper bound, I'm just going to make a huge positive number. I'm on a standard normal distribution curve because I'm talking about a z-score. So I'm leaving mu equal to zero and standard deviation equal to one. Be careful, you do not put this stuff there because I'm just finding the area corresponding to that z-score. And I get 0 0.45564, 0.455. So this area, this is approximately 0 0.45564, 0 0.4556. They don't tell you how to round, but they're taking a lot of digits. So now you might be asking me, why is this not matching my p-value? 
because it's a two-tailed test. If it were a one-tailed test, this would match my p-value. Actually, I'm going to show you that. If I change it to a right-tailed test, I'm not second bar stat. I'm going to show you. If I change it to a right-tailed test, check it out. Changing it to a right-tailed test, my p-value matches. 0.4564, blah, right? But because it's a two-tailed test, this is my output and the p-value is much larger, but check this out. When I did my normal CDF, I'll do it again. Should already have my stuff in there, right? This is the area which represents that probability in the right tail, but the p-value is not equal to that because it's a two-tailed test. So I'm gonna take two times the area, double that, and I should get my p-value, 0.9128, right? Five, and this is slightly different because I rounded, right? 0.91128, typically with p-values we take four digits, but 0.91128. Um, and again, they don't really say how they want you to round, but, but look, this is like I'm saying, you have this to verify your p-value so you could determine if you're doing this part correct based on looking at your test statistic and your p-value so this is really it's just making me go out of my way for no reason but trying to get me to understand the whole process behind p-value um but after this question i'm not going to use it again again i made this turn so I hope that makes sense. I didn't finish the problem yet. I'll finish it just because they're going to ask me for a conclusion. Um, so let's see. Since the p-value is equal to, so are they really making me put this in again? Yep. Since the p-value is equal to this number, 0 0.91128, and I don't know, this drop down is probably comparing it to alpha. It's either less than or greater than or equal to. And this is way bigger. So we'll put greater than or equal to. Um, your significance level, which, where is that, 10%, I missed that, alpha is 0 0.10, which is 10%, and that's what goes here. Um, we drop down, what does the drop down say? We reject or we do not reject. So let's go to my tests. And they're asking me to use a p-value method. And my alpha, my p-value is way bigger than my alpha. And it looks like they're going back and forth between fail to reject and do not reject. So know that they're the same thing. But my p-value is way bigger than alpha, so we're failing to reject, which means we're not rejecting, which means we my, do not reject. That's what goes here. Do not reject the null hypothesis. And since we do not reject the null hypothesis, we would say, in others, we cannot conclude. I'm going to put this. We, I'll type this up for you because I didn't have this up. They have one more part where now interpret your final. And this is what we go through every single time. This is this, they made us go through extra stuff for the p-value for no reason. We, I'm going to just put, um, I'll put conclude and we'll determine if we can or cannot. I'll make this like blank we conclude just so i have this that the mean sales of mcdonald's restaurants in florida differ from the average McDonald's sales worldwide so let's see the only thing that changes between these two, because they have two options here, is that either we conclude or we cannot conclude. So let's see which one it is. Um, and one thing I'm going to underline is differ, because there's technically two ways that I can say this. But being that they said differ, we're talking about the alternative hypothesis, which is differing. So are we agreeing with the alternative or are we not? Can we support the alternative or can we not support the alternative? And if you want, you can go back to, I got all this stuff here. I'm failing to reject the null. I do not reject the null. So I cannot support the alternative. 
And if I cannot support the alternative, I cannot conclude. Cannot conclude, and that looks sloppy. That the mean blah 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 blah. Okay, I'll put this here so you know that that is the change between the two options. So once again, this question is really just making you go through the old process of finding a p-value, but once you get through this question, you never have to do that process again because you got to calculate a trick or whatever you guys use, dev mode, but you have your trick that gives it to you right away. Like you don't have to go through that. So um, I'm gonna stop recording and